Hey everybody, what we're going to cover in this lecture is the fifth lesson for my human language course. We're going to focus mostly on probabilistic grammar and apply that to logistic regression. So in continuing from last week's lecture, we talked mostly about grammatical slots. So what word will go next in a series of words or a collocate? And we looked at how Americans and British uh, English speakers use the word quite differently. This is still really about grammatical slots, thinking about the likelihood of specific verb conjugations or uh, word choice. And so we can model word choice based on its contextual features. So the other words around it, which might be good for distinctive colexeme analysis, or more salient features of the sentence, or even regional variations in dialect. So this is building upon association measures, allowing us to create more complex models understanding specific word choices. Um, so really this, uh, this particular example is about syn synonymy. So how do we decide which word to use when we have multiple options in our lexicon that share the same meaning? And I don't know if these are the best examples, but here are some examples. So um, I blanked to go to the mall this week. How might we decide between I planned to go to the mall this week, I decided to go to the mall this week. Those are clearly, they have slightly different meanings, but both are valid verbs in this sentence. I scheduled to go to the mall this week, and I'm going to go to the mall this week. Um, so we have a couple of different options that essentially get across the same semanticity about our plans for the week. And we might choose between planned, decided, and scheduled based on the type of plan where we're um, deciding to convey, right? Uh, another option might be adjectives. So she is very pretty, beautiful, or alluring, right? So those all convey the same basic message, but how do we decide between them? And so um, a couple more examples where we get specifically into the Dutch word uh, verb choice today. Um, so we might choose between may versus might, depending on how much certainty we want to convey. I may go to the mall this week. I might go to the mall this week. So those um, very dictionary wise have the same basic definition, but subtly they contain a level of certainty that we're wishing to to display to people. <clears throat> uh, we might also choose between gown versus dress, and this would indicate more of the subtlety of a social situation. Um, and so you wear a gown to something fancier while you wear dresses to something a little more casual. Um, although, to be fair, it is called a prom dress, right? Um, and a wedding dress. So this might also have a little bit of um, cohort effects in it as well of word choice across the years. And then my personal favorite, since I'm from Texas, is the choice dialect choices, um, not dialect, uh, cultural choices based on regions of the country. So um, if you are in the Midwest, you're most likely going to say soda. If you're from the Deep South, you're most likely going to say Coke. I mean, from the Northeast, at least, we're going to say pop. And then soda kind of is uh, mostly a, also a Western, a Western United States choice. But there are very clear distinctions between, let's say, for driving up the East Coast, which one people would say. Um, so forever, I called everything Coke. After living in the Midwest for a long time, I've now managed to switch to soda. Um, but those are cultural factors that play into that word choice. So there's lots of options that we can use. And so if we want to model word choice, we have to find ways to code what might predict those word choices. So we're focusing today on causative constructions. Um, and there, this is the like linguistic topic of the day and uh, their sort of development and change. And so those are phrases in English, like I might, I have to uh, get causing X to do something to do Y. So they're, they're causal and they really are causal where you, the actor <clears throat> am, is someone else in the sentence. And if you think of yourself as the person 
speaking the sentence, you are the one causing the actor to do it. So you're essentially asking or forcing someone else to do something. Um, so it combines the conjugated to have or to get with a direct object and some other main verb. So it, <clears throat> these specifically are when one does not carry out the action yourself. So if you think of yourself as the main person in the sentence, you're not doing the action, but you're having someone else do the action for you. So here's an example. I had him paint my house. So had being the conjugated um, causative, him being the direct object, and then the main verb paint. I am the act, um, the cause let me not get these wrong. The cause in the sentence is the actor, the person who does the action. That's the him. The cause-er is the person who required the action. So I would be the cause-er. I had him, him being the cause um, And so uh, these sentences are particularly interesting because there's a lot going on in them because of the uh, conjugated uh, causative part and the main verb, and then figuring out who's doing the acting. Um, and so what we can do is look at the different um, word choices for this. And specifically, we're going to look at do versus let in Dutch. Okay. And I watched some videos on how to pronounce these, but I'm probably going to get it wrong. It's doen and leighton. Um, but really, the question, I'll kind of keep it in English to keep it straight, but do versus let. So these are causative constructions in Dutch. When do people pick do and when do people pick let? Um, and so the theory is that do appears to be more of a direct causation. Like I am sort of directing you, whereas let, um, <clears throat> keep, skip over here, appears to be more of an indirect causation. So for example, for do, uh, I took this quote from the, from the article I was reading for this. So if the energy is put in, the result is inevitable. Okay. Um, so he reminded me of my father, um, which in English would not be considered mostly a causative construction, but the way that it's built in Dutch would be. Um, <clears throat> and so that's involuntary, that um, the, the cause involuntarily made you, um, reminded you of your father. Um, and you would be the cause e, I'm sorry, <laughs> these, these are confusing to me, so I don't, I don't want to confuse you guys. Um, the cause e is the actor, right, who does the action. You are being reminded. The causer would be the he, the person who had that action. So he caused you, right, and you are the cause e, to be reminded of your father. Okay. Uh, let is more of an indirect causation, more about uh, permission giving. And so I let him paint my house. Okay. This would be close to one in... Um, in English, um, where I gave you permission to paint, right? And so in this case, the actor in this sentence would still be him, and you would be the person who caused the action. So why why do these happen, right? So why are these, um, why do we build these causatives, basically? And so there's three main components to um, how they, what their purpose is, and so we can focus on the individual verb. So this would be, these were things, um, the purpose of this list is to show you things that you could code in an analysis. So how could I predict which one people are going to give us? So let's say you're trying to build a predictive um, text system or um, write sentences that would capture the way that people actually use, in this case, Dutch, but or you can think about this in any language really, what are some ways that you could code those co-locations to um, then test a model on? And so sometimes these are built based on the verb. So um, are these state verbs, like are a state that you're in, or are they action verbs? So you could code each verb combination with the to have or to get and that verb and um, write down if they're action verbs or state verbs to see if one of them is more likely in a given situation. So that would really be a good association measure, but the purpose of um, predictive, you know, predicting probabilistic grammar is to build this with lots of variables. So we wanna focus on some other things. And we might code the transitivity of the verb. So are they 
with transitive verbs? Are they with intransitive verbs? Or does it occur in both situations? So we could um, take an instance of, I had him paint my house. Um, is that second verb, that's an action verb, right? Is it transitive or intransitive as well? So two ways that we could think about coding these to predict. Here's some more. Okay. What about the actual action being caused, right? So does the cause have control over the action? This is sort of the, the, the indirect versus direct, the causation. So he reminded me of my father would be involuntary control. Um, it just happened versus um, I let him paint my house. Uh, you would have control in that situation. You could, I guess, tell him to go away. Um, uh, volition, does the cause act willingly on this choice? Or effectiveness, so how is the cause affected in the sentence? So we could code each one of those as sort of a yes, no. Um, effectiveness, you might have to come up with some semantic or thematic coding, but you could <clears throat> include that as a variable. And one last set of things that um, we think people use cause, causative constructions for um, are related to the causer instead of the causee. Okay. So directus, how, how direct is the causer in giving a command effectively? Uh, intention, is it accidental or intentional? So I had him paint my house would be intentional. Um, Accidental would be more of a indirect kind of <clears throat> intention. Uh, is it natural? So is a natural activity things that you would do anyway, or are there is there an effort to this? So something that you are um, putting energy into. And involvement. So how is the causer involved in the activity? And these are just some of the suggestions for reasons why we use these causative constructions. There are obviously other variables that we could encode, um, but just kind of an idea of why people think, at least in English, why we use these, um, and ways that I could figure out taking sentences with all of the to have or to get combinations and then code them for each of these things. So we could use those to predict. Another thing we could do is simple frequency or uh, regional dialect of a language, and in the example we're doing today using Dutch, we're going to look at a, little, a couple of those. Okay. So some criteria specifically for do let, uh, very, um, a focus on why those are the way they are. And so uh, they've been coded in this data set for four different combinations for one and this is all in one variable. So they might be inducive, where a mental causer, usually think about this as human that helped me distinguish what was going on, to a mental causey. So this would be the let combination. So I'm inducing them to do something. Um, then we might have a volitional option, option where I have a mental causer to a non-mental causey. So I... Um, you might think of this as like human to car or something. Um, and this is sort of neither is predicted. Um, it's kind of equally used do and let. Uh, an effective option. So you'll see that some of these um, terms match the bigger list of options um, where we have a non-mental causer to a mental cause. This is more of a do combination. And a physical option where it's non-mental to non-mental. That's also kind of a do option. So we have some, based on some previous liter literature, some predictions of which one is more common for let, which one is more common for do. Um, and we might see that the volitional one is neither. Okay, so some predictions from some previous literature where people have studied these um, do let constructions and um, suggested that these are the uh, different ways that people use them. So let's see if we can predict that with other variables. And we're gonna do that with logistic regression. So a couple weeks ago, we covered normal, like normal linear regression. And uh, we talked about the regression model. So when, when building a, a linear regression, we have a person's individual predicted score, which is Y hat, sub so I. So for each person, we are creating a predicted outcome variable um, using our, uh, our X variables. And 
with that, we take each person's predicted score and we look at their real score and we figure out how far off we are to look at our residuals, right? So we want the error to be as minimal as possible because this would be a least square sort of analysis. So the smallest possible error um, predicting your score. Um, then we would move into the actual equation where b sub zero is the y-intercept. This would be the uh, mean of y when basically because all of the x variables are zero. And this would be the best prediction we would have as the mean as a model if none of the predictors were useful. And so this would be the case when all of x is zero, if, if x could be zero, and um, <clears throat> we only had the mean of y as a predictor. Generally, these are not very good models, so we would add our predictive variables to see if we can get better than just a, a guess of the mean. So b1, x1 would be the first uh, predictor variable, so it might be word frequency. And so for each participant, we are word in this case, we have a frequency of those combinations, and then we would see what the slope is. Remember that slope in a continuous model is uh, interpreted as for every one unit increase in x, we have b unit increases in y. And so essentially uh, you can think about, um, you know, for every one unit of word frequency, we get x units of um, y. And so a couple weeks ago we did response latencies. And so that's a negative relationship. So as words become more frequent, words um, response latency decreases. So we'd have a negative slope. And we might add other variables till we were done. Um, it was like a little bit about overfitting today, but mainly you don't want to use more variables than you have participants because then you can make a perfect equation, which you don't want to do. Um, and um, essentially a succinct number of variables because as you add more variables, you lose power. Right? We never get any person completely correct. Right? So each uh, individual person also has an error term and that's the difference between their predicted score and their um, actual score. Right? So what are we going to change when we move from least squares analysis to a log logistic regression model. And what we're going to see is that effectively the equation is the same idea, but y is now a categorical option instead of continuous option. So we're going to look at the log odds. So let's kind of skip on to this next page here. And the main distinction here is g, the function of gy, okay, which is a logit or a log odds of the outcome. And what that does for us is um, allows us to predict the distinction between two categories. Okay. So we could do bon binomial logistic regression, which is when you are um, outcome variable has two options, or multinomial logistic, sometimes called polytomous regression, when your um, outcome has more than two options. This lecture is going to focus on binomial logistic regression. And then I have a separate lecture that's already on YouTube that you can watch if you're interested in multinomial regression. And it really like interpretation wise, once you get the hang of logistic regression, these are very similar. It's the data setup for multinomial that is the worst part because you have to restructure your data, um, mostly using the mlogit package to handle multiple outcomes, more than two. All right, so what is GY? GY represents the odds of one choice over another. So in this analysis, we're going to set up one of the variables as a um, kind of a, not a control, but the, the, um, the compare, one of them is the comparison group and the other one's kind of the control. There's not a good word for this, um, where the uh, lower group, meaning the one that R codes first is the compare is the sort of control and the second group is the comparison group. This will make a little more sense when we look at one of the analyses. Um, and it, it, their predicted score um, represents an odds. The actual score of a participant is literally which choice it was. So uh, we don't quite subtract in the same way to calculate residuals, but we look at how many times we would have predicted that they pick that option versus when they did pick that option. So we're creating more of a like percent correctness as one of our measures of model fit. And so um, 
what GY is, what you'll get out of this analysis if you wanted to, is the probability of one of the outcomes versus the other. And it's all based on the probability of basically the option two in comparison to option one. Okay. Everything else is pretty much the same basic concept. So B0 is still the intercept here, and that is the chances of the outcomes when all the other predictors are zero. Okay. Now, in our particular analysis, we have mostly categorical variables predicting categorical variables, which makes this especially fun. Um, so a categorical variable is never really zero. But what we're saying is when all the other predictors are the first category, this would be what the um, likelihood is for um, our two choices. Uh, in an analysis where all the predictors are continuous, this would be the likelihood of that outcome when the predictors are zero. So the interpretation here changes just a little bit based on uh, the type of predictor variables you have in the analysis. Okay. B1 here would be the slope for the first x variable. It's still considered the coefficient. Um, but these are presented to us in odds. So uh, mostly in log odds, because log odds is a little easier to interpret than odds. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, you can still think of them as coefficients. And so their log odds are positive and negative, and it allows us to interpret them in a similar way that we might um, uh, regular coefficients. And then all the other B values are also still coefficients. Okay. But um, since all of our data is categorical in this particular analysis, we'll have to think about what does that mean when the outcome is categorical and the predictors are categorical. So we're picking a particularly difficult case um, so that you can kind of interpret everything. If the predictor is continuous, it's a little easier. So let's try it. So some basic requirements for log regression is that you have enough outcomes to predict. So we need a large enough sample size in the outcome variable in each group as they become lopsided. It is much easier to predict an outcome because um, one of them is just literally more frequent than the other, and it will bias the analysis towards that. So in a perfect world, you have a fairly even 50-50 split of your outcome variable in a binomial regression, because then you can actually truly try to predict it. Um, however, real life doesn't work that way, so um, just trying to keep that balance um, not too lopsided, because as, like I said, as it gets more... Um, uh, the probability just base gets higher for one of the groups, the analysis will look like it's running well just because it's easy to predict a group that's much larger than another group, right? just likelihood-wise. Um, how big does this have to be? Lots of different arguments here, um, but some have suggested, mostly a hosmer Lim show have suggested that the number of predictors can be based on the smaller group, sort of divided by 10. So our smaller group here is Dune, and uh, at 178, I could have 18 predictors. Okay, that would be wild, <laughs> that's a lot. So if you only had 50, you could have five predictors. Um, I've seen this all over the place, really, um, but we would want to make sure that we have enough things to predict. Um, so bigger sample sizes are better. And then we want to make sure we don't add more predictors than we really have cases. Um, and so about 10 people per predictor is not a bad rule of thumb. Okay. So we'll, uh, this data sets in the Arling library that we've installed. Um, the data set is Dune Latin. And so let's just look at the outcome variable. Which one did they pick? And we'll talk about two things here. Uh, the first one is that the split between them is, it's not perfectly even, but is, is pretty good, right? So one group is not way more likely than another group. So pretty nice split here, which implies that we can probably model this word choice. Um, now, if we're any, being any good at is a different question, but the, the availability of the data is there. 
The second thing I want you to notice here is by looking at this table, I can tell which one is going to be the sort of control group and which one's going to be the comparison group. Okay. Um, so since Latin is coded first, it's the sort of zero level group is how some people talk about this, where uh, it, everything is compared to that. So the probabilities that you get are the likelihood of dun compared to Latin in that particular uh, X combination. So all of these probabilities will be the likelihood of the second word, you know, compared to the first one. Um, and we'll get into like how that number set works here in a second, but just kind of remembering that that um, is based on the way that R has coded these, which is normally in alphabetical order. It's sort of interesting that it's not in this case. Um, but if you wanted to flip them, you could simply use the factor command or re-level to switch that order. Um, and that will take all of your coefficients and simply flip the sign. So it doesn't really change the analysis, but it does change the interpretation. So we're gonna use the RMS library, which does a bunch of really cool regression models. Um, we can also use GLM and given our approach, so GLM is in base R, given our approach, the thing we wanna do, we'll pick one over the other. So I'm actually gonna run it in both which seems a bit tedious, but um, the options in each package make it worth typing the code twice. Um, so RMS has some really cool ordinal least squares and models. We're gonna use um, the logistic regression options from that, but there are lots of um, regression options that normally in base R would be kind of here, there, and everywhere, kind of packaged into one. The package homepage has a really great table that shows you what their option is compared to other packages and base R options if you're interested in um, looking at how this package compares to other ones. Okay. So we're going to do both so you can learn a little bit of both. So let's just kind of look at what's in the data set. The first column here, ox, is the um, choice. Which word did they pick? country here for the Netherlands or Belgium. So which one um, uh, are people using? Uh, which, <laughs> which country are they in? Um, to look at uh, regional differences. Uh, the causation option here is uh, the four different types of reasons that we think people choose do versus let. So inducive, physical, effective, and volitional. So given that sentence, someone has coded them thematically for what is happening in the sentence. EP trans here as if the verb is transitive or intransitive. EP trans one is so that you can look if you include two variables that are highly correlated in the analysis, what happens. So EP trans and EP trans ones are highly multicollinear. They're almost the same column. And so if you're wanting to understand how, how some of them um, analyses change when you have multicollinearity, you can try including that in your analysis. Um, because uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but things like, like uh, frequency can be highly collinear with other frequency options, and so you have to pick one, basically. So it's a way to see how you might diagnose particular multicollinearity problems. So we had this problem once on a paper we were working on where we were looking at typing, and um, word length is almost perfectly correlated with the number of hand finger switches that you might use when you're typing on a keyboard. So we had to pick one of those options because when included together, they kind of um, blew up the analysis. So we're gonna run the model. It does not print well in Markdown uh, slides, but I also will provide the actual Markdown document. And um, one thing, Let's look here. It looks much cleaner when you're actually printing this in R, the, the way that the model output runs. And this particular package does not use the summary function, so you just type the name of the model and tell it to print. So this is sort of a little weird one because it does not require the summary options. But we'll look at each piece kind of one at a time. Um, but if you're out there, people who've used this package, I cannot figure out how to get the entire table. <laughs> so I just kind of cut and pasted it in the slides here. Um, but how do I build one of these models? So we're gonna use LRM for logistic regression model. This uses a maximum likelihood uh, estimation. 
And so what we'll do is you do the same LM format we're used to for Y. So which choice they add is predicted by, so tilde, plus causation, transitivity, and country. Doesn't matter what order here. So this is just like LM. Um, and then comma data equals, and then the name of the data frame. So what will happen is after you save your model, you can print that out. And it will give you all of this interesting stuff. And the first main thing it tells you is the number of observations and the split that we've already looked at in our table. And that's handy just to make sure that it was ran the way we thought it would and also would uh, allow us to check, make sure there weren't any missing data points so it didn't drop half of you know one group. Okay. Let's get into these other things by um, using some output code. So frequency here is our important for data screening. I think you probably should have looked at this beforehand, but if you haven't, now you can see um, again, which one's coded as the comparison group to the control group, so that's the likelihood of done given Latin, um, compared to Latin. Um, the uh, frequencies here are uh, a good split so that we're not, all, you know, if it were 90% to 10%, it would be very easy to predict because the 90% one would be a good choice. So in overall predictedness, so when we talk about regression analyses, there's sort of two questions. Am I predicting better than chance, right? So the overall um, variance that I'm predicting, which doesn't quite make sense in this analysis, uh, but we'll get there in just a second, uh, is that greater than just knowing the mean, right? So this is code of all the predictors together at once. And so we can do model dollar sign stats to look at these, or you can look at the, the, the pretty output by just printing model. Um, and instead of being an F test, so linear regression is an F test, uh, comparing basically R squared to zero, um, or the residuals to zero, right? Um, we'll do a likelihood ratio test. A likelihood ratio test is a chi-square test where essentially we're, um, com is comparable to our F test in regression. We're just seeing if, um, the likelihood is greater than nothing. Um, and so this is akin to chi-square of that idea of like there are differences there. In chi-square you're sort of calculating the, the difference between expected and observed values, right? And so this same idea um, but applied in a slightly different way. So how I might write this up is I would look here at the degrees of freedom so there are five degrees of freedom from our model. This is chi-square here in our model likelihood ratio. And then it gives me the p-value for that as well. Okay, so p less than 0.001. Okay, let me back up. So all of that is actually here, right here in the middle, um, and in kind of a nicer format. And it tells you, hey, by the way, this is chi-square. Um, and the comparison, it's gonna make this a little, hopefully a little bit more small, solid, in a linear regression is a model with no predictors, right, where the mean is the model, to a model with predictors. Right? And we'll see, is R squared different in those scenarios? Now we're doing the same thing of a model of no predictors. Um, how deviant is that? Okay, instead of how big are the residuals, um, a model with predictors should have less error in it because you've gotten closer. Except now we're calling error deviance instead of residuals. So it's the same basic concept, except now error is a completely different term. Because instead of taking the difference between a predicted score and my actual score, we're taking the, the prob essentially the probability of um, which word choice would they pick. I predicted you picked this choice. Did I get it right or not? So we're kind of looking at a, um, a match. How many times did we match and get and actually predict the right word choice versus not? And so that leads us into goodness of fit. If so, we can take this chi-square and say, well, this is better than chance, but um, what can we do to talk about how good the model is? So this is kind of like effect size, right? So goodness of fit statistics, um, generally people talk about these with factor analysis or structural equation models, but they also work well for regression models. Where we're looking at um, how well the model fit the data. 
and uh, we could look at R squared. I've always seen R squared with these. Uh, the book that we're using sort of says that people don't like R squared. I would say people report it, so let's talk about how to do it. Um, so it's similar to an R squared in a linear regression model. Although thinking about this as the, the variance accounted for is a little difficult when the, the outcome variable is a categorical option. And so I always kind of think about it as a, a measure of match. Um, R squared in these scenarios can be a bit biased. Um, and in this particular output, it's Nagel Kirk's pseudo R squared. So it is not a real R squared, it's a fake R squared, but it's a similar I idea. And there are some criticisms of these particular R squared options, but they're fairly popular to report. So let's look at that. So R squared here is 61%. So I can't say that it's 61% of the variance because there isn't really variance, right? There's two categorical options, but we could think about this as like sort of 61% of the time we're doing some good guessing. Um, it's not the concordance. That's the next slide. Um, but it does give me a comparable idea. So I, I know that that effect in a linear regression is quite large. So I can think like, okay, we're doing much better than zero. And so to me, the usefulness of this is not giving you a solid 61% of the variance in this particular data set is accounted for. It gives me a good comparison point, like, oh, that's a pretty big effect. Um, a better option is oh, it's called the concordance index. And I've always reported these as like percent match, but I didn't realize it had a name until recently. Um, and so what happens is for each person, uh, in this case, for each sentence that they examined, um, the model predicts a specific probability of the second word, right, dun. And um, if the probability is over 50%, so over 0.5, it will, that suggests that they would pick dun. If the probability is less than 0.5, that would suggest that they would pr predict the second, the first word in Latin. Um, if the probability is right on 0.5, that means you have no idea. It's a random guess. You know, 50-50 chance of each one. So those probabilities are created and then they're compared to the actual outcome. So if the choice in the sentence is actually done and the probability is over 0.5, that would be considered a match because you have predicted the option they actually used. Uh, and same the other way. If the probability is below 0.5, it would go towards Latin. And if that's actually what you picked, that would match. So this is called the concordance index because it's how much they concord they match. So C here is the number of times that the <clears throat> outcome Y sub I matched the predicted outcome G, G, G of Y here. Um, and uh, that interpretation is uh, here are some guidelines from Hosmer Lim show. If it's less than 50%, there's no discrimination. You're doing less than it's just a random guess. At 50%, it's a, it is literally a coin toss. From 70% to 80% is acceptable. 80% to 90% is excellent. And 90% and up is outstanding. So you gotta do better than 50-50. But after that, you can kind of um, increasing levels and in, imply a better models. So for this particular model, I'm gonna back up one slide, you can see the concordance index here under C. Um, and so we're almost at 90% match. So we're doing really well at predicting when they choose these particular words. That's like the best prediction I've, I've seen in a long time. I'm usually like in the 60%, so a model that's only okay. Um, so now we know our model is pretty good, right? Um, the overall statistics are significant, P less than 0.05. Um, better yet, our effects, our, our goodness of fit measures imply that the model is predicting well. Let's actually look at what is predicting. So in that model output, there uh, it says coef for coefficient. Okay. These coefficients are log odd coefficients. So they're not in the scale of the data, which would be a little make sense because the outcome is um, logit. Right? So a traditional odds ratio, um, think sports betting here, is centered around one. 
where when we talk about six to one odds, we're talking about six times more likely than the control, right? So the comparison group is six times more likely than the control group. And if you said the odds are 0.5 to one, then you're saying that the um, control group is more likely than the other group. So the, they're centered around one. That works okay if you only talk about the odds of the second group. Um, getting into the odds of the first group gets kind of confusing and um, you're familiar with this kind of sports betting idea. Um, log odds ratios have the benefit of being centered around zero. So a 50-50 chance is now zero. Okay, I have no knowledge of which way this should go is the way I think about this. Um, I have zero information. Uh, my best guess is a coin flip. Positive numbers indicate a higher probability for the coded or group, the comparison group, so Dun here in this case, um, which I just reprinted the levels and the ta uh, this is another way to get at it is levels. So we've done table, we've done levels, and the output from the model actually show us this. And so anytime I have a positive coefficient, it's a higher probability of the second group. Anytime I have a negative coefficient, it's a higher probability of the comparison group. Thankfully, this is the same interpretation you get if you use a by, point by serial correlation, where uh, positive indicates that as whatever is going up, it's more likely for the second group, and negative indicates whatever is going up is more likely for the first group. So um, that's the nice thing about log odds ratios is they match that idea. So positive means more towards the front, the uh, second group. Negative means more towards the original or the first group. And so just to print out a reminder here, which one's the comparison group. Uh, so I think I maybe have not said this quite the same the entire time. So Dun here, Dun here would be, uh, I called it the coded group. Uh, I've been think I've been calling it a comparison group. It's the one that the probabilities are based on. This would be control, might be a better word here. It's the, the um, compared to group. So I told the model to print out and I just reprinted the coefficients so we could look at them. I um, um, couldn't figure out how to get it to print the entire table since the summary function does not apply here. Um, but anyways, so the intercept here would be uh, the likelihood of the second group to the first group when every one of these categorical options is the, con the, the first group or the control. So when we did our linear regression um, class, we talked about how to deal with categorical predictors. But as a quick reminder, when you have four options here for our causation type, uh, everything is compared to one of the options. And here it's gonna be compared to the first one, which is effective. Um, we could reorder those to get a different comparison set if you wanted. And what that means here, where it says causation equals inducive, that is effective to inducive, right? And physical to effective. And so it, it's basically creating little mini t tests, or here, a little mini chi square tests um, of those combinations. And so our intercept would, if you wanted to interpret this value, would be when every one of these variables is the control group. So it'd be effective intransitive in the Netherlands. Okay. I don't know how much I think the intercept is useful, um, but here, since the coefficient's positive, that implies that it's more likely to be done in this scenario. But it's really difficult. So let's like dig into the actual coefficients here. And um, I made a, since these are all categorical, um, I made a quick, um, um, to a uh, chi-square frequency table to, uh, this is not chi-square, just a table <laughs> of the outcome variable and this particular categorical variable to help solidify what these are doing. Okay. So everything again is compared to effective here because it's the first alphabetically. <laughs> and so this first coefficient line um, is the uh, effective versus in inducive and it's negative. So what that means is the likelihood is more uh, is biased toward len because it's negative, right? which is our control our control group, um, and then 
the way you interpret this is that the uh, the inducive, the label on the coefficient, is the one that is more likely. Okay. So if when the case is inducive versus effective, the Latin option is more popular. And I think the easiest way to see that is to look here at this table. So just this first little section here. Ignore physical and volitional here for a second. If I look at this two by two frequency table, essentially the argument is when it's inducive, it's way more likely to be Latin, which I think you can see from the, the numbers here um, because it's 160 versus 25. Okay. When in comparison to effective, that is like the, the combination is that Latin is way more popular. Okay. So 160 to 25 versus 15 to 75. And so that negative coefficient makes sense because now we're saying that Latin is more popular when it's inducive okay. in comparison to effective. Here for physical, we see that it's not predictive. And looking at physical, that's because they basically have the same pattern where Latin is way less option, way less likely, and Dun is more likely. So there's no real difference between those. Knowing that it's effective versus physical doesn't really get me anywhere. It's just going to be done. Um, last for volitional, we see the same basic pattern where um, it's negative. So Latin is more popular. So let. Um, and you get that same like reverse pattern where done is more likely for effective. Volitional Latin is more likely. Um, this matches the hypotheses that we started with um, where one of them is more likely for let the inducive option, whereas uh, effective and physical, if I'm back up here, is more likely to be due. I might have to say that backwards. Let's, here we go. Yeah, no, I got it. So inducive is more likely to be let. Effective and physical aren't different because they're both due. Volitional is kind of an interesting one because it doesn't match where the prediction was that it would be sort of 50-50 split. And if we get back to the slide here, um, you can see that it was not actually what is happening. It's way more likely for let. A couple of other predictors to look at here. So we've got the transitivity of the variable, okay? and that is a negative coefficient. So uh, when the variable is transitive, it's more likely to be um, let versus do. And if you look at the, case of the frequency table here, what we see is that when it's intransitive, there's really no differences. It, it, it's equal. But if it's transitive, it's way more likely to be let. And so this combination here in comparison to intransitivity implies that um, if it's a transitive verb, it's going to be let which matches because it's negative. Remember, the negative is the lower one, so for Latin. Okay. Last one for um, Belgium. So this one is um, positive for the first time, so that means it's more likely to be due. And what we can see is in comparison to the Netherlands, this is very true. They actually have a fairly even split where they're using both words e equally, but in comparison to the Netherlands, it's more likely to be a do option. You're going to see that more than the Netherlands would use it. Okay. So we find that there's a difference in the the use of the word, the causation type. Um, we're finding that there's a difference in transitivity, so the match to the verb, so more of a grammatical question. And we also find that there's a, a usefulness in understanding which country this is coming from, so more of a cultural thing. So this analysis altogether really shows us that we can predict word choice you know, probabilistically, um, based on like semanticity of the sentence, the syntax of the sentence, right? Well, kind of like grammar, verb conjugation of the sentence, um, or the transitivity of the verb, and also culturally. So this builds on our association measures where we were only really could like look at the you know, word combinations together one at a time. Now we can predict. Uh, take all of those and put them all together in one analysis. So this is building on what we've been doing by allowing ourselves to create bigger, more complex models of word choice options.
So we didn't do this in our last lecture, um, but then on one of our assignments, we kind of, in my class, we found um, some really bad <laughs> heteroscedasticity. So we're trying to predict, actually Dutch, the Dutch lexicon project, trying to predict response latencies. And you know, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it would. Um, so we used the English lexicon project in the class lecture, and then we used Dutch for the examples, and they didn't quite match. And when looking at the residual plots, we find some really bad heteroscedasticity. And so, well, it's probably because there's some interactions there that we can't see or some other variables that we're not using. And so I thought I would talk briefly about a cool way to kind of look for interactions to build upon um, our conversations that we've been having in class. And I don't know that I'd actually recommend just digging for interactions, right? You should be able to, you should know that they're there. Um, but they can be useful to analyze for. So this is not a full like lecture on moderation, um, which is the name for interactions and regression. It's just kind of a, an interesting way to look visually for them um, with the caveat that probably should expect some interactions instead of just like uh, fishing for them, like trying to find them. Okay. So to, to do this though, uh, we need to use the GLM function instead of our logistic regression model from the RMS package. Um, and so kind of a quick how to use GLM, the <clears throat> formula is the same. It, it intakes a, a formula in the same syntax of y tilde x. This is the main difference, really. You have to tell it which family you want to use. So it's GLM for generalized linear model. Um, we want to use a binomial family for a logit regression. Uh, and then the data set name. So very similar. Um, now I'm going to compare my main model that we've already done to a model where we're looking at the interaction between transitivity and country because um, verbs are a little different here and so maybe one country uses more transitive uh, whereas another country maybe uses more intransitive words. So capturing the fact that those cultural differences are actually also tied to verb choice. And we can compare those two models. So is it better to include the interaction versus not right? um, with the ANOVA? So I've always told my students I found it very funny that the ANOVA function doesn't really do ANOVA. It does model comparison. So if I take model one versus model two with, with and without the interaction, is there a significant difference in the, the deviance effectively? Okay. So that's a chi-square test of um, the residual deviance here. And what we find is that it's not significant. Okay, so chi-square is 3.12 and p is 0.08. So adding the interaction doesn't necessarily improve our model a lot. Um, and if we ran this with RMS, we could look at the R-square change and the concordance change is really actually not that helpful. So this is not a, a large model improvement. So maybe very small amount added by this interaction. But the neat thing about this is that we could visualize the interaction with the visreg package. Um, and to me, that's worth talking about because it's really, really very cool um, way to, to see those interactions. Okay. But if I were looking at the output, so you'll see the, um, here's the coefficients for GLM. Um, and they're very similar. Um, Here's the interaction component, and we could tell that actual predictor is also still not significant. So the model change is not significant, and the predictor is also not significant. So this would maybe not be a um, useful interaction. But this thing is really cool. So um, if you don't have the vis reg or visualization for regression package installed, uh, install that first. But what I did was I th uh, put in the second model with the interaction. You tell it what variable basically to put on X. So how do you want to split on the bottom? Um, and then the by option is also splitting by country. Uh, by country. So the, bo the, the, the bottom here could be continuous. Um, and we want to um, create panels in the by option. Um, so interpreting interactions. So we have <laughs> essentially... Categorical interactions predicting a categorical variable can be kind of tricky, so I think the visualization helps here. So um, 
this is the intransitive versus transitive verbs for the Netherlands versus Belgium over here. And um, the if the interaction were there, what we would see is that the uh, difference between intransitivity and transitivity is larger for this group, this country, than this other country. And so that interaction isn't quite present, but but if it were, that would be because the difference here is larger than the difference here. Um, and this is essentially the predictor. So these are the simple slopes. Uh, doesn't quite work when you're talking about categorical variables, but um, these are the, 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 the differences in the predictor variables given these combinations. And so um, here that slope will be larger than this slope. Um, you can also do this with continuous variables, and so you could look at what the differences are. Um, so in the, if I apply this to my regression chapter, we could look at the differences in part of speech type looking at frequency, because some words are more frequent than other, others, so how does the part of speech and frequency interact when predicting uh, response latencies? Uh, last thing we'll end on is just some um, basic assumptions, diagnostic tests for looking at logistic regression. Um, but the great thing is that influence plot from the car library still works. Uh, however, it requires a GLM object. So I put in model one, which is our original model from GLM, um, instead of the RMS object. Uh, it creates us the same basic picture where we have um, Leverage across the bottom, the student ties residuals, um, which is a measure of how far the probabilities are off uh, on the y-axis, and the size of the bubble is the influencer Cook's values. And so we don't really see any particular ones that are in the super scary region up here or down here. Um, we do see some that have some um, larger influence uh, than others, and we could look at what those word combinations are. In these types of models, unless you've miscoded the data, those are pro real data points because words don't act up like people do. So um, we would probably want to continue to leave those in, but maybe figure out why they specifically they're outliers. Are they special idioms or are they a special phrase? Like why are they not as predictive as others? Because if I was trying to build a, let's say, predictive text model, it would be interesting to know the exceptions. And then the assumptions, the assumptions are great for logistic regression. There are very few. Um, first one, big rule, common, common rule across all uh, statistical analyses is the assumption of independence. So each sentence is independent of other sentences. Um, we could argue that that's not the case. And so we could look at some multi-level lo logistic regressions, um, but let's say the observations are independent. No multicollinearity because we're doing regression, so we could use the VIF options from RMS. Um, that's uh, just to distinguish it from car because we also have car open in our environment right now um, and VIF is also in car. And uh, I think they basically do the same thing. I'm just going to stick with RMS because we're talking about correlations between categorical predictors right now, so this will work a little better if we use the package that built the model. Notice here I have just model because I'm using the RMS object. And for VIF values, variance inflation factors, right, we talked about there's kind of two rules of thumb, either greater than 5 or greater than 10, but all of these are fine. So essentially there's not any suppression or multicollinearity going on in these variables. These None of these are so correlated to each other that that's bad. And then a sort of an interesting one that you have to be careful with is overprediction. Okay. And so overprediction can occur in a couple of ways, but specifically here I want to focus on complete or quasi uh, separate, quasi complete separation. And this happens particularly in categorical variables where one predictor is perfectly correlated with the outcome. Meaning that one, if you created a little uh, table of the combinations that some of the cells are zero, meaning that when you use, let's say, for example, when you use transitive verbs, it's only do. It never is let. Okay, that makes it a perfect predictor. And that 
surely is handy if we're building um, a model, but when we're talking about like predicting a regression will blow up the entire analysis. So if you have a perfect predictor that makes maybe coding this um, imaginary t predictive text system pretty easy, but does not allow us to really m look at how the individual contributions of each variable, right? Because one of them is the the end, like the end done, right? Um, so with that case, what you'll see is the standard errors in the model will be wildly large. So we can look at this one even though it's the interaction. We always want to look at our standard errors to kind of understand um, the variance in the predictor and uh, none of these we want to be large. Now large depends on the scale of the predictor. Here this, these are all pretty pretty safe numbers. Um, and then we didn't talk about Z or Wald's, Wald, the Wald statistic earlier, but uh, these are just a measure of the ratio of the estimate to the error. Right? Um, so good variance to bad variance or sort of um, how useful this is given sample size and all that other stuff. Um, and so if the standard errors are really large, you either have a multicollinearity problem or maybe a perfect predictor. And so you could look at, to diagnose that, you could look at a VIF for multicollinearity, oops, sorry, or you could um, create the like bivariate categorical tables. So run the, the um, run a table of the DV by IVs one at a time and investigate those to make sure that none of, one of the cells all have numbers in them. And so, uh, like for example, in chi-square analysis, you really don't want cells that are less than five um, or essentially have a bunch of zeros. So you have to do usually Fisher's exact test. It's a similar idea where we don't want to have cells that have very low frequency because then that makes it very easy to predict which one it is because the very low frequency one means it never happens. So special consideration of using a lot of categorical variables. All right, to sum everything up, what we talked about lingu linguistically um, is modeling word choice. And so these, ha you know, this seems like a, like a s pretty simple analysis, like, okay, you know, linguists are interested in this sort of thing. How does that apply to a larger data science perspective? I mean, we're talking about essentially these predictive text models or are, are this on steroids. Um, and so if we can think about how to do this with two, we could scale. Um, but it also might be a, like a hypothetical question of like which word choice should we pick here um, uh, in a marketing scenario. So there are different applications of this and we just did binary logistic regression. Um, you could extend that to a multinomial logistic regression with mlogit. And I have a, specifically a YouTube video that covers mlogit and the issues with the data structure in that that I didn't think would fit in this lecture. Um, but, and specifically for my students, if you have three outcomes, that would be one way you could model all three of them kind of together. Um, if you have four, please stop. <laughs> so the more you add to a multinomial regression, then the more difficult it gets. Um, and then like statistically, we talked about how to run and use a logistic regression along with those assumption checks and understanding how to interpret the output. Cause that's the main goal. Is it explaining to people what happened in your model? So altogether, we learned about causatives and logistic regression.